that I like quite a bit. It involves cross-country racing. I've encouraged many people to watch it. I even went to movies to see it multiple times so as to support that Christian movie that was out, and I thought it was so good. And there's an important dynamic that kind of builds up in this movie, an important element of the plot line, and it deals with this girl who is a cross-country racer. And she's getting ready for this big race, you know, she's kind of running throughout the year, uh, the the school year, and doing these races, and it leads up to a big race at the end of the movie, and then there's her dad. She didn't know that this person was her dad. She ends up coming to find out that he was, but he couldn't be there because he was sick, and he was approaching the end of his temporal race, so to speak. But her coach was able to figure out a way in which she could hear the instruction of her dad via a recording as she ran in this big race. So there she is in this huge race, and all of a sudden at a certain point in the race, she hits the play button and she hears her dad coaching her through each part of this race, encouraging her to kind of stay the course, when to push ahead, and so on. And that is reminiscent of what Paul is doing for Timothy here in 2 Timothy. Paul is reaching the end of his temporal race, He's about to go home to be with the Lord. He knows it. He's about to be poured out as a drink offering. And one of the concerns in the forefront of his mind is his young son in the faith, Timothy. He wants to give him instruction. So even as Paul is reaching the end of his life, he knows Timothy still has laps to run, so to speak. And he didn't want Timothy to get derailed or disqualified. He didn't want him to be discouraged or disheartened. He didn't want him to shrink back or get sidetracked. He wanted him, and we'll see this language in chapter 4, he wanted Timothy to fulfill his ministry. And so as to be clear, you're not just reading someone else's mail. This letter that Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit for Timothy and for those where Timothy was, hence the plural pronoun at the end of this epistle, grace be with you, but better translated, you all, this letter is for you as well. God intends to speak to his church through this letter. Timothy's times, as I've told you before, were different than ours, but they were nonetheless turbulent. And God has purpose to help you navigate the turbulence that we are experiencing, and he has purpose to help you and I arrive home safely through the means of his living word. So as you get ready to hear Paul's instruction to Timothy, be reminded as you are running your race, even as Paul wants to make sure that Timothy stayed the course in his forthcoming laps, God wants you to stay the course in your forthcoming laps. And your days are turbulent. I'm not saying that they are the same as Timothy's, but God has provided a way for you to navigate the turbulence and to make sure that you land safe and secure in His presence. His Word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Well, let's create a little bit of context as we prepare to get into the text. In previous verses, you remember that Paul told Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of fear, i.e. a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and of a sound mind, all of which are graces that come as a result of the presence and ministry of the person of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who begets in us power, love, and a sound mind. The same Holy Spirit who empowered the apostles to speak the word of God with boldness, Acts chapter 4, verse 31. That same Spirit who empowered Stephen to boldly bear witness of Christ before his persecutors when faced with martyrdom, Acts chapter 7, verse 55. That same Spirit would empower Timothy to minister courageously and not be ashamed. That same Spirit would do the same for you, son or daughter of God. Paul would tell Timothy and exhort him to join in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, 2 Timothy 1.8. So remember, Timothy was not going to suffer in his own strength. He should not even try to suffer in his own strength. He was to suffer according to the power of God. God's power at work in him, producing endurance and perseverance and patience in the midst of tribulation, even with joy. He was to suffer according to the power of God. Timothy, you'll be reminded, did not have to look for suffering. You don't have to look for suffering. 
If you just live faithfully as a son or daughter of God, suffering will find you. Persecution will find you. You speak up for Jesus, persecution will find you. Now, if you recall, when Paul mentioned the gospel towards the end of verse 8, and when he mentioned God at the end of verse 8, that set him to think under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about God's great grace and salvation. So where does he, where does he start? He starts from before time began. That's where he starts. Because that's where grace started for you, son or daughter of God. When did God's grace towards you begin? Well, according to 2 Timothy 1.9, before time began, before the foundation of the world. What was before the foundation of the world? God was before the foundation of the world. And God purposed grace towards you, not according to works, according to the text, but according to His own purpose and grace, 2 Timothy 1.9. Now, it's important to remember, whenever you consider what the Scriptures say, with relationship to the doctrine of election, that doctrine that speaks of God's unmerited grace towards those who would be the objects of His grace, and in time justified by faith in Christ. When you think of that doctrine, you are to think about the Scriptures, I would encourage you, that speak about that doctrine so as to provide guardrails as to how you are to understand it. We know that election is not according to works but according to God's grace. You see that right here, 2 Timothy 1.9. We know that it's not according to him who wills, so it's not according to man's willing or man's running some kind of exertion, but according to God who shows mercy, Romans 9.16. We know that it's not according to the will of the flesh or the will of man, but it's according to the will of God, John chapter 1, verse 13. And furthermore, we know that it was something purposed before time began. Ephesians 1, 4 uses this language. It was before the foundation of the world. And if you say, why? Why me? Why am I the object of God's grace? It was according to God's good pleasure, Ephesians 1, 5. It was to the end of the praise of His glorious grace, Ephesians 1, 6. And it was according to the counsel of His will, Ephesians 1, 11. Those are your scriptural guardrails. That tells you what election was not according to and what it was according to. And I would encourage you to have those guardrails up as your understanding uh, to help you in your understanding of that doctrine. So we left off with Paul speaking about that grace, that gospel grace that was purposed to us in Christ before time began. And now we see a little bit of a transition. Paul writes about how this grace was manifested in time via the gospel. We begin... 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, where we read, But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So notice the shift here. You see it in the language right at the beginning of the verse. But now. So having spoken about eternity past, as it were, he now transitions. But now, shift of focus to gospel grace seen and demonstrated in time. He begins by saying it was revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus. Paul so often uses that word appearing with relationship to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but here it clearly deals with the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of God was gloriously revealed in Jesus' incarnation, as well as in his subsequent perfect life and sacrificial death and victorious resurrection. Now, don't miss how Paul identified Jesus, our Savior, Christ Jesus. Some brief notes on that. Jesus is that. He is the Savior. The angel told Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. There's only one name under heaven given to men whereby they must be saved. Acts 4.12. And that's Jesus. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised Him from the dead, we shall be saved. Saved from what? From the wrath of God. From the penalty of our sins. The holy justice that our sins 
deserve. And that we deserve as a result of our sins. He is the Savior. He is the Christ. He is the promised anointed one. He is the anointed one in the most ultimate sense. He was given the Spirit without measure. He was the promised Son of God who would be the Messiah. But having identified Jesus, Paul then proceeded to expound upon what he accomplished. He is the one who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So first we see that Jesus abolished death. He abolished death. It's interesting because the Greek word that's used here can essentially mean, it can mean abolished. It can essentially also mean to render inoperative or to nullify or to bring to naught. Jesus, through his death on the cross, he rendered death, you could say, inoperative. Now, somebody might ask, okay, well, how does that actually work because we still die, right? So death has not been abolished in the sense that we don't see any death anymore. We've entered into that state described in Revelation 21 where there is no more death. We don't see that now. Death is still happening. So in what sense is death abolished, someone could understandably ask. Well, some have contended that Paul's references in the second half of this verse to life and immortality, since both of those references deal with spiritual things, spiritual life and immortality, i.e. eternal life, that the death that's spoken of here, the death that is abolished, is spiritual death. And that much is clear. We know that Christ has done that on our behalf. If you were once dead in trespasses and sins, you've been made alive in Christ spiritually to never die anymore. Jesus puts it like this in John 10, 25. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, he will live. Then he goes on, he says in the very next verse, he says, And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Because there's a sense in which spiritual death, having been abolished, you are alive never to die again. So I think that is a true statement. But I think that there's a sense here in the text where we could see the death blow having been laid to death via the death and resurrection of Christ. There has been a death blow that has been laid to death. Now, the same word that's used here, katarageo in the Greek, is used in Hebrews 2 to speak of how Jesus rendered inoperative. Some translations might say abolished or brought to naught the devil. And there is a sense for believers in which as you live your life now, the devil has been made inoperative. He's still a foe that you have to be aware of. He's still there. But there's a sense in which the death blow has been laid to him and it has been appointed and assured that his time in the lake of fire is coming just as it relates to death. The death blow has been laid to death and ultimately one day death will be swallowed up in victory. But there's also a sense in which even as the devil has been made inoperative, Jesus having disarmed powers and principalities at the cross, Jesus having bound the strong man, Jesus having filled you as a result of his death, burial and resurrection and subsequent ascension with the Holy Spirit, you now can walk in freedom apart Apart from the fear of the enemy, apart from the fear of death, per Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, there is a sense in which the death blow has been laid to death and death has been made inoperative. It's an enemy that's still around, just even as the devil is an enemy that's still around, but there's a sense in which the wires have been cut. Picture trying to get into a vehicle. And all of a sudden you try to get into your vehicle and it's not starting, it's not turning on, your vehicle is still there, but you're trying to get it going and it's not working. Because somebody cut all the wires that would make it go. So it's there, but it's been rendered inoperative. And there's a sense in which what Jesus has done for us on the cross has rendered death inoperative. It's still a reality to be contended with, even as Satan is a reality to be contended with, a being to be contended with. But think about how Paul describes death in his epistles. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is what? Gain. Talks about death essentially being the doorway 
This this momentary transition, this kind of doorway where one goes from putting off their earthly tent and all of a sudden they go from being absent from the body to being present with the Lord. It's like this river that you just cross through for a moment because Jesus Christ has taken away the fear of death and if we live in light of the fear of death, we need not live in light of the fear of death because Jesus has abolished death. He's rendered it inoperative. It becomes merely a doorway. If we were seeing rightly, if we were seeing through the lens of the Holy Spirit, when we think of the days of our death, we would think of it as the moment in which we are going to cross over and enter into the presence of our Savior in a way that we've only read about in the Scriptures. To see him face to face, we would say, you know what, when that day comes, granted, I would miss whoever I'm going to miss here, but to be in his presence, to walk through that doorway, it's a precious thing. There isn't this murky fear of the unknown. Think about what it was like before you knew Christ. I don't know about you, but I know when I thought about death before I knew Christ, it was a fearful thing. I hated the fact that I did not know what was on the other side of death. I would try to appease myself with thinking, I'm going to a better place. I have no assurance of that. At least I didn't. But now, all of a sudden, Jesus, having abolished death, rendered it inoperative, so whereby you and I could live our lives without a fear of death. It's a reality to be contended with, but it's an enemy to which the death blow has already been laid. Jesus also, we're told, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So life, I would argue here, most likely spiritual life and immortality, i.e. eternal life, has been brought to light via the gospel. You could say in the Old Testament, the nightlight was on. So you could see things with relationship to spiritual life and immortality in the Old Testament. It wasn't that it was completely dark, the nightlight was on. How bright was the nightlight? Well, that's arguable. But I'll say the the light was on. And you could see some stuff there with relationship to immortality. For example, Job, for instance, knew that after his skin was destroyed, that he in his flesh would nonetheless see God. Job 19.26. Job, Old Testament saint, had an understanding. After my flesh is destroyed, I will nonetheless in my flesh see God. Job had an understanding of the resurrection. As did Daniel. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, Daniel spoke of that day in which those who slept in the dust, i.e. those who had died, would awake, and some would awake to everlasting life, and some would awake to disgrace and everlasting contempt. So Daniel wrote of the resurrection unto everlasting life, and he wrote of the resurrection unto everlasting punishment. And there are other examples that can be given. So please know, the light was on in the Old Testament. But it was a nightlight. It was a light with a dimmer switch. And what happens is when Jesus comes via the gospel, all of a sudden you can say the dimmer switch gets pushed up. And all of a sudden light shines on immortality and spiritual life. We now understand regeneration at a much greater level. We understand about the new birth. Jesus unpacked that in John chapter 3. Paul speaks about it in Titus chapter 3. We understand about... So Jesus having spoken about new birth, John chapter 3... Paul speaking about Titus chapter 3. We know about the resurrected body more because we see in Luke 24 what Jesus does in his resurrection body. We see that he's able to eat food in his resurrection body. We have 1 Corinthians 15, which speaks about the perishable putting on imperishable, the corruptible putting on incorruptible. We have glimpses of heaven in places like Revelation 4 and 5, Revelation 21 and 22, the new Jerusalem. We even get glimpses via what we see in the book of Hebrews to know that right now there are spirits of just men made perfect who are worshiping alongside of saints and angels. And there's a sense in which we join in that worship when we come together for corporate worship. So it's as though the light has shined on the reality of eternal life and immortality via the gospel. You have a much better understanding by the grace of God than Old Testament saints because you have New Testament revelation. You get to understand things about the resurrected body and what the new Jerusalem looks like and what is in store for the people of God in a much greater way, in a much greater way than before. So follow the train of thought. Paul was essentially telling Timothy that he could suffer according to the power of God as his eyes got a better grip of the grace of God. That's essentially what Paul's telling Timothy. 
You see that grace before time began? You see that grace manifested in time? Join with me in suffering for the gospel. This gospel is so great that God purposed grace for us from all eternity. This gospel is so great, Jesus abolished death and brought life and light, brought to light life and immortality through the gospel. And then Paul here, he goes on and all of a sudden kind of, it's a parenthetical thought, but it's really not. I'll explain why. He says, after referencing the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. So the words for which clearly connects it back to the gospel. Okay, so for the gospel, Paul was appointed, that Greek word there, there, tethemi, essentially means to be put in place. Paul did not put himself in the place of apostleship or as a teacher in the church or as a herald of the gospel. He was placed there. You'll see him speak to the church, churches of Galatia saying that he was an apostle. Not by man nor through a man, but according to God the Father in Christ Jesus. He was appointed. And what was he appointed to? He was appointed to be a preacher and an apostle and a teacher you got to love that. Even though Paul was regarded as a criminal, he recognized that he bore titles of great dignity. People might have looked at him as merely an imprisoned criminal, but he knew that he was a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. Now, the word that's used here for preacher, this Greek word kerux, simply means that, preacher, a herald. It's used to describe Noah. Noah was a preacher, same word, Second uh, Peter 3. Uh, 2 Peter 2.5, he was a preacher of righteousness. This word was also used to describe someone who would announce the message of a king to the community. So you can picture a messenger coming into the town square and saying, I have a message from the king for this community, and that's essentially what Paul was doing in his ministry. I have a message from King Jesus for the churches in Galatia, for the people in Galatia, and Lystra, and Iconium, and all the other places that he went. He was a preacher. And I think he's referencing that because Timothy was also called to do the work of preaching. And so he's saying, I know what it's like to suffer for these titles. But stay the course. Join with me. Timothy, we know, he's, Paul's going to tell him, fulfill his ministry as an evangelist. And we know that Timothy preached the gospel to Corinth, for example. Second identification Paul used was that of an apostle. He was an apostle, not by man or through, through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. He was an apostle that was on the same level of authority as the Twelve. Um, now, he was in that unique role, I would argue, that was limited to the first century, the apostles being the foundation of the New Testament church, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. He was one who had seen the risen Lord. He was one through whom signs and wonders were done to testify to the veracity and the truthfulness of the message that he proclaimed. He was an apostle in the capital A sense. Timothy was regarded as a, if you will, a lowercase a apostle in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6, along with Silas. But you can clearly see differentiate, differentiations there between Timothy's apostleship and Paul's. And Paul, when he's writing to other churches, he would say, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. So there were differences. Timothy was an apostle in the, in the sense of him being a sent one to the Thessalonians, preaching the gospel of Christ and the truth inseparable to it, and they understood and received it not as the word of men, but as the word of God. So Timothy could relate to these identifications. They would inform his own ministry, even though, for example, here he wasn't an apostle in the same sense as Paul was. And then he identifies himself as a teacher. You know, sometimes I think people misunderstand what Paul did. They read 1 Corinthians 2 and they think that Paul just went to places and he concerned to know nothing among them except Jesus Christ and him crucified indefinitely. As though it were wrong for anyone to expound upon anything else other than the gospel. No, Paul preached the gospel and the truth inseparable to the gospel. You just need to read the epistles to see how important teaching was to the Apostle Paul. He taught about Christ. He taught about the gospel. But he also taught about how the church should run and how elders were to be qualified and how the church should handle different responsibilities, widows and things of that nature. He was a teacher of the Gentiles, even as he was an apostle to the Gentiles. He uses two of these identifications in 1 Timothy 2.7. And again, Timothy could understand because Timothy was called to make sure that the church was nourished in sound doctrine. While I point out those points of comparison, 
Because even as God uniquely called Paul to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, thus resulting in Paul's duty to be faithful to those callings, Timothy had to be faithful in his callings. It's like Paul saying, I was, for the gospel, I was appointed to these things. Implicitly, he had to be faithful to them as a result of the appointment. And he's encouraging Timothy to be faithful to his appointment. And I just want to encourage you to be faithful to your appointment. You have specific ministerial responsibilities that God has given you. You can start by looking in your home. You can look, if you have a spouse, you can look to your spouse and understand what your biblical responsibilities are towards them. You can go to Ephesians 5 and start seeing what it looks like there. You can think about your biblical responsibility to your children. It's a ministerial responsibility that you have. You can look around in this room and you can look around how you are and understand how you are to be your brother and sister's keeper. We are to love one another, not like Cain, 1 John chapter 3. So we have all these blessed responsibilities. We've become those who have the treasure of the gospel and we are to share it with others. So let me just encourage you. Be reminded in light of Paul's identifications here that salvation is unto service. Salvation is not unto a waiting station. I'm saved. Now I can just wait for that bus of, <laughs> you know, um, death to carry me into the presence of my Savior. No, salvation is unto service. Now, not surprisingly, those titles did not exempt Paul from suffering. Rather, they were impetuses for suffering. Paul says as much in verse 12 where we read, For this reason I also suffer these things. For what reason? Well, I was appointed as an apostle and as a teacher, as a herald. For this reason I also suffer these things. What things? Well, previously he referenced his imprisonment and that he was a criminal. So it's because I was called to these things and because I'm going public with the gospel and I haven't been ashamed, I am suffering. I am in chains. I'm on the brink of death for these things. But look what he says. But I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed though. And Paul understood the blessedness that accompanied sufferings. He would write in a place like Romans 5.3 that suffering produced endurance. Doubtless he knew Jesus is teaching that when one suffered and was persecuted in the same way that prophets of times past were, that they were to rejoice and be glad because their reward in heaven was great. Paul talked about how he would find delight in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties, 2 Corinthians 12.10, because he knew in those times that the power of Christ was perfected in his weakness, 2 Corinthians 12.9. He knew that what he endured, he endured for the elect's sake, for the sake of the elect, that they would obtain like salvation, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. He was not ashamed of the gospel, Romans 1, 16, because he knew it was the power of God unto salvation. So Paul had a bunch of reasons for which he was not ashamed of the gospel, reasons why he was not ashamed of the gospel. But notice the reason he references here. He knew what suffering did he knew the blessedness that came with it. He knew the power of the gospel. But here he says, for this reason I suffer these things, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Notice the personal confession of faith here. Paul did know what he believed. And it's important to know what you believe. Paul knew that Christ died for his sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul knew what he believed. But I love the language here. Paul knew in whom he had believed. He knew that his God was trustworthy. I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. There was this intimate knowledge of the one that he entrusted his soul to. And for that reason, he was not ashamed. And that kind of trust, when Paul uses language here and he says that he is able to guard, speaking of God, what I have entrusted to him until that day, there are different arguments as to what Paul means here, but I think the most likely reference here is to Paul's soul and his eternal well-being. 
I've entrusted, by the grace of God, I've entrusted my soul. Kind of the using language from 1 Peter 4.19, entrusting his soul to a faithful creator. He's entrusted his soul and his eternal well-being to God. Because he knew God. And he knew he could be trusted. You wouldn't trust someone with something so precious if you didn't know them. Like you wouldn't walk across the street and you wouldn't say to someone, if you had a little child, can you just watch my baby for a few minutes while I go and get something done? You wouldn't just entrust something so precious to a stranger. When Jesus spoke about a man's soul, he said, what can a man give, or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? The idea is you have nothing more precious than your soul because it will continue to exist forever. And Paul knew whom he had believed. He knew that he was trustworthy, so he entrusted his soul to a faithful creator. But it wasn't only that God was faithful, it's that God was powerful. God was able to keep and is able to keep all who entrust themselves and their eternal well-being to him. That's the idea here. I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day, i.e. the day of Christ. And so what, what is driving Paul's unashamedness? The fact that he knew God and the fact that he knew that God would keep him. I could go forward unashamed and I can go forward in courage because I know the one in whom I have believed. And I know that he is able to keep me. Jesus spoke about this in John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, how his sheep cannot be plucked from his hand, how his sheep cannot be plucked from his father's hand. Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, that we are kept by the power of God through faith. So who's keeping us? God's keeping us. We are kept by the power of God. What's the instrumentation that God uses to keep us? Faith. So God keeps his people through the instrumentation of faith. All that are born of God overcome the world. All in whom Jesus begins a good work. He will complete that good work. All that the good shepherd rescues will be carried across the finish line. And think how that should drive courage. So you could go and you can minister and you're not worried that you're going to fall through the cracks. You're not worried that your faith is going to give way. You may have other things that you're concerned about, but if you are a Christian and you know in whom you have believed, the one in whom you have believed, then you should be persuaded. The same word Paul used in Romans 8.38, for I am persuaded, I am convinced that neither death nor life. And he goes on to list other things. Angels, demons, things to come, things present. He knew that nothing, no created thing could separate him from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And that is to empower our ministry. And that is to empower our unashamedness. So I would encourage you, in closing, I would encourage you that in the days in which we live, where there are many temptations towards fear, I want to encourage you to embrace the reasoning for Paul's serenity. (laughs) Paul could have great peace and great unashamedness because he knew the one in whom he had believed. The one who sent his son to die on the cross for sinners. The Savior who laid his life down for Paul. He knew him. He knew his love. He knew his trustworthiness but he also knew that he was able to keep that which Paul entrusted to him. Namely, his soul and his eternal well-being. And if you haven't committed your soul to a faithful creator, if you haven't entrusted your soul to the one who laid his life down on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, I would encourage you, today is the day of salvation. Do not wait. Entrust your soul to the care of God through faith in Jesus Christ. What does that look like? It looks like you turning away from your sin and saying, I know I don't deserve heaven and I can't secure my own entrance into the kingdom. But I believe that God has made a way in which sinners like myself could be forgiven through faith in Christ. You commit your eternal well-being to Him. You trust the person and work of Christ. And then you trust that the Good Shepherd is able to save to the uttermost. Hebrews 7.25. He's able to get all his sheep across the finish line. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we, by your grace, in light of your revelation and your word, can join with Paul and say, 
I know whom I have believed and am convinced and persuaded that He is able to keep what I've entrusted to Him until or against that day. So Father, I pray that the reality of Gospel grace that predates the foundation of the world, in light of Gospel grace that was demonstrated in time via the incarnation and subsequent death and resurrection of Your Son, and in light of Gospel grace that keeps us all the way into the day of Christ and unto forever. Heavenly Father, help us to where appropriate join in suffering for the Gospel. Help us, Father, to minister with love but also boldness. Help us, Heavenly Father, to not shrink back or get sidetracked, but help us, Father, to minister with courage and unashamedness because we know the One in whom we have believed and we are persuaded that He will keep us. May it be, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.